days, weeks, months, seasons, a year. Now almost two years. Time was passing by the glazed windows of Sir William Masham's great manor house, where Roger Williams still faithfully served as a chaplain. But with time comes change, and Roger was certainly changing. You see, Sir William had a niece, a beautiful young woman named Jane Wally. Jane came often to visit her aunt and uncle at their grand country estate, and so came to know the young chaplain. Roger enjoyed Jane's company immensely, and quite suddenly, he realized that he wasn't happy being a bachelor any longer. He was in love. He decided he would like to marry this young woman. Jane's father and mother had died, therefore Roger went to her guardian, Lady Joan Barrington, to ask if he could marry Jane. He wasn't prepared for what came after. Lady Joan refused. She said that Roger was not of noble birth like Jane was, and that he didn't make enough money. She said he had no right to ask to marry Jane. Poor Roger's heart was broken. He went sadly back to his work. He tried not to think about Jane anymore. He wondered if he could ever be happy again. But Joy did not stay absent long. He met another woman that same year, a servant in the Masham household. Her name was Mary, and she was the daughter of a cheerful Puritan preacher named Richard Bernard. Mary was delightful, even more lovely than Jane had been, and Mary's father cared about things much more important than noble blood and riches. Mr. Bernard could see that Roger had a good heart. And so, Roger and Mary were happily married that very same year, 1629. But it wasn't just Roger's life that was changing this year. England itself was also changing. Though, it wasn't happy changes that were coming to England, as they were to Roger. And if you just watched my English Civil War series, you'll already pretty well know what I'm talking about. The king... Charles I had just closed Parliament down. Parliament is supposed to help the king rule the country, but Charles didn't like what the men in Parliament were saying. He didn't want anyone to tell him what to do. So Charles has sent them all away and declared that he would rule all by himself. And with this new rule came much trouble for the Puritans of England, for King Charles had a close friend, a man named William Laud, who was determined to get rid of anyone who spoke against the Church of England. Because he was the Bishop of London, and such a close advisor to the King, this Bishop Laud was a very powerful man. And he was cruel. Laud set at once to persecuting anyone who disagreed with him, throwing them in prison, beating them, and all manner of horrible things. Life was becoming rapidly unsafe for Puritans and other dissenters in England. Roger began to seriously consider the future. He was especially at risk of persecution, since he had now taken the even more radical stance of separatism, meaning he didn't want to purify the Anglican Church any longer, but instead had totally separated from it. And he was also particularly in danger because he was a preacher. In response to these dangerous changes, a great meeting was to be held at Sempringham this year, hosted by Theophilus Clinton, the Earl of Lincoln. This Earl was himself a Puritan, and he was inviting dissenters to come and discuss an idea. An idea of a colony in North America. A colony where they could worship in freedom. Roger was determined to attend this meeting. He boarded a stagecoach and headed straight for Sempringham. It was a long drive, but by no means a boring one. Two other preachers were traveling with him that day, Thomas Hooker and John Cotton. The three men engaged in a long and very interesting discussion about theology as the carriage bumped and jolted along the roads. Roger soon found that he disagreed with these two men on many things. 
but he was polite as he debated with them. When Roger arrived at the meeting, he found that many wealthy and important men were in attendance. John Winthrop was a fellow of particular interest, the son of a lawyer and landowner from Suffolk. Winthrop was one of the strongest voices in the planning of this new Massachusetts Bay Colony, as it came to be called. When at last all the plans were made, and a charter was granted from King Charles for the creation of this colony, it was Winthrop who was chosen to be the governor of it. It was April the following year when John Winthrop left the shores of England at the head of a little fleet carrying over 700 refugees from religious tyranny. As a city on a hill, the eyes of all people are upon us, Winthrop solemnly told his followers, so that if we deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword through the world. Roger Williams was not there to hear that speech that would later become so famous. He stuck to his post on Sir William's estates for now. But as the persecution grew increasingly worse around him, he began to reconsider. What if he did go to prison? What would happen to his sweet Mary? His thoughts, too, began to wander across the Atlantic, to the city on a hill. Ugh! Not you again! Okay, listen, I know we didn't get to America yet. This is the American series. I'm not pulling your leg. Just give me a break! <sighs> really though, guys, I promise. Next episode, we're getting out of England. For now, anyway. <laughs>